I want to take a look to start with at Constantine Cavafy. Uh, <clears throat> not the easiest poet to uh, to grab hold of, but uh, few in the modernist age are. But he has a lot of uh, really sensuous, really suggestive lyrics that are just fun to dig into. Uh, he was born in 1863. He lived to the ripe old age of 90 and died in 1933. And led a fairly nomadic life throughout Europe and uh, North Africa <laughs> for quite a while there. He was, he was Greek. He wrote in Greek and had Greek heritage. But he was born in Alexandria, Egypt, right on the water. Nice, uh, nice little resort, very international city in that, uh, in that age. Uh, he later lived in Constantinople and England. Uh, he, I believe he started out in Liverpool, making him the fifth most notable artist to come out of that city. Uh, and, and he also spent some time in London. And, and that was most of his, uh, his adolescence uh, in England where he was able to pick up a fair command of English and broaden his horizons a little bit in terms of uh, his literary exposure. Uh, he returned to Alexandria eventually. His family was having some hard times financially. It had a succession of minor catastrophes. So they, they did wander around an awful lot. He only visited Greece, which plays such a huge role in his imaginative life as, as, as a middle-aged man. And, uh, and to this day, the, uh, he is not, well, he, I'm not going to say he's not popular in Greece, but, uh, but his relationship with it, uh, with that, uh, with that country, with that culture is still a little bit fraught. Uh, but he did do pretty much all of his writing in Greek, and he identified as Greek, very much so. And when you read his work, you get a lot of uh, references to classical Greek culture and uh, the, uh, the Hellenistic period, particularly. The life from there as an adult was fairly uneventful, quite frankly. He, he worked as a journalist and civil servant. For, uh, for a little while, and then around age 50 or so, I think, he, uh, he was able to retire from all of that and dedicate himself to poetry. He published very little during his lifetime. He circulated most of his poems by hand among friends in a way that was popular, you know, in the Renaissance age and the Middle Ages, quite frankly. But he didn't have a lot of interest in in putting his work out there in a, a in a popular way, which I think lends a certain quality to the intimacy of his work and also uh, the high level of uh, intellectual rigor, quite frankly. He has some very uh, abstract ideas floating through his poetry and it, his poetry assumes that you have some familiarity with uh, classical history and some very sophisticated ideas. Along the way, however, he did strike up a friendship with the English author E.M. Forster who wrote Passage to India and Howard's End and a number of other uh, remarkable novels of the Edwardian era. And he helped promote Kafafi's work. He helped, he helped Kafafi gain an international uh, readership uh, while he was sort of without a home uh, internationally, let's say. The work itself, he did uh, catalog quite thoroughly. He did gather together a, an impressive body of, of, of work, a lot of original poems that he organized to himself, and he encouraged everybody to view them in terms of three broad categories, historical, philosophical, and mm -hmm, erotic. And uh, as you're reading them, it can be a temptation to to start to slot them into those categories as you're reading, but 
that is, even if that's what he tended to do with them, I think that's probably a bit of a dead end. It limits them. Uh, why do that? Why slap a label on them before you even really get in and start to make sense of it? Uh, give it a chance to blur some of those lines because so much of his work is about blurring those lines and giving uh, alternate perspectives, alternate viewpoints, uh, and suggesting it could be this, but it could also be that. And that's where modernism broadly is such a rich opportunity for interpretation because there are no hard rules about what something is. They are not trying to be objective. They're not trying to be forensic. They're trying to suggest much more than can ever be expressed on the page. And that's why while he had a decent following throughout his life, especially towards the end of his life as a poet, he has continued to grow because his poetry is so suggestive, because his poetry is so nuanced and at times maddeningly opaque, uh, we can always dig into it and find new meanings. Because if he said, you know, this is a poem about the steam engine, we wouldn't care anymore. Nobody would read that anymore. But if you suggest that it that a, that a poem is about, let's say, a mechanism in some vague way, well, every age has that problem. Every age has that conundrum in their culture that we can latch onto. And because of his uh, blurability on that scale, his readership tends to grow <laughs> and he has become really uh, quite a figure over the last couple generations and is often equated with uh, figures more conventionally regarded in the modernist, uh, modernist age, figures like T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound and Gertrude Stein and Marianne Moore and all of those figures who had a kind of notoriety and recognizability from a much earlier age. Cavafy is more or less in that pantheon by now. So when reading his stuff. Uh, just look for a couple of things broadly. Uh, number one, he keeps to a fairly simple diction and syntax. There's nothing particularly arty about what he, or how he is saying what he is saying. It, it, it is all fairly accessible and recognizable. And in that you can also see a pretty regular uh, formality uh, of rhyme and meter. This is more in the original Greek than recognizable in translation, obviously but in terms of syllable counts per line, in terms of rhyme schemes, uh, those things are very well crafted as, uh, as he lays them out on the page. And thematically, he, he blurs past and present. He is always living in the modern with a reminiscence of the past. And those little togglings back and forth, again, is very classically uh, modernist. The ability to see that we are, in a way, a, uh, the apex of a civilization that has been growing from the beginning of man, or we are the nadir of the civilization since it has been falling <laughs> since the beginning of man. Uh, but either way, we are not individuals walking around completely independent, but we have this kind of ghost hanging around us of who we used to be. And those ideas, that nuance, is uh, part and parcel of a general approach or a general embrace of abstraction and its, uh, and its contrast with reality. The, uh, the vagueness of his ideas tend to all have a kind of uh, otherworldly analog. They're always imbued with a kind of philosophical, metaphysical, note. And that 
again, explodes the art off of the narrow parameters of the page. And you can start going off into the different possibilities of meaning in a very productive uh, and, and rich way. And of course, very recognizable in, in many of these is the note of eroticism, uh, and in his case, homoeroticism. He was a homosexual, he was a, uh, he was openly, admittedly that, uh, still a fairly, you know, reserved man generally, he wasn't out there leading the gay pride parade or anything, but he was not ashamed, and, uh, or at least from what we can tell in his work. And so that lends an awful lot to it. And at the same time, because of the uh, because of the somewhat hidden, secretive, and in some cases shameful nature uh, of, uh, of uh, homosexual desire in, you know, that time, and sure, in today's time as well, uh, there is a certain hidden quality, a certain uh, irregularity, a certain opacity to those references that honestly only charge them more because if desire is somehow clandestine, if desire is somehow forbidden, that is tantalizing. And he uses that to energize many of these poems and suggest things in a way that have a lot more power than to just say, you know, somebody started to get the itch. Uh, there is a, a great um, energy there that is, uh, that is just extraordinary to see. And, and, uh, and, and can lead to lots of other associations beyond the sexual. So th there's an awful lot in there that you can start to recognize and an awful lot that I encourage everybody to think about as we're going through these poems because they are, uh, it is an extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary body of work.